All right, good afternoon. I would like to do the study on Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, for the Ephesian church, letter to the Ephesians. So I hope you're ready to learn some. This is going to be an interesting study. I'd like to dedicate this one to my friend Mary Davis, who's encouraged me to continue with the study. So without further ado, let's pray and let's get into it. Father, I do pray and ask that you bless the reading your word. I pray that you bless this study, that you'd strengthen us, encourage us, and teach us as your will designates. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What I would like to discuss first is how the letter to the Ephesians is a letter written to the individuals of the church as well as the church themselves. It is a letter that is describing people that have left their first love and have walked away. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 13 through 16, it says, The woman which has a husband <clears throat> that believes not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. God has called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? This passage in Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7, speaking about how if you're married to an unbeliever, if the unbeliever wants to leave, they are permitted to do so. They are not under the law. And that's what the letter to the Ephesians is about. The the word Ephesus or the church at Ephesus, Ephesus means a person who lives at Ephesia. Ephesia means permitted, permitted to leave their love. And that's what this letter is about. So let's begin and um, reading and we'll begin our reading at chapter 2 verse 1 and he says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You see, there it is in verse 4. And Ephesus means those who are permitted to leave their first love. And that's why it ties into 1 Corinthians 7. Because you see, when a man and a woman come together and they make their vows, at first they're in love with each other. But then the spirit wanes in one of them because they're not a believer. They have not given themselves wholeheartedly to the other. And as a result, the flesh, which was what attracted them together, cannot keep them together. The unbeliever will want to leave, or he'll want to quit being with the one because his heart is not in it. That is the same situation here with the Ephesian church, and it's in most churches today. He says in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Do the first works, or else I will come upon thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. <clears throat> he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So, we're going to begin here in chapter 2, verse 1. And he says, basically, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. The angel <clears throat> means messenger. Angelos or ang angelau, it always means the one with a message that has been sent to give it a message or deliver it from the master. So when he says this has been written unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, it means the message giver. And we learn who the message giver is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He tells us he gave pastors who are the teachers to the church. The words in the Greek is poimen on dediasko. 
the pastor he gave them to the churches who is the teacher the pastor who is the teacher that's why it, in 1st Timothy 5 17 it says let the elders speaking of pastors that are over the churches rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially or means particularly the ones we're speaking about who labor in the word and doctrine so the letter is to be written to the pastor the one who gives the messages from God who leads and guides and directs and teaches the word over the church of Ephesus the word used here for church is ecclesia and it means not just those who are part of a congregation but it means those who have came deliberately to hear God's revelation to hear God's word to learn about God so they can take his yoke upon them and go out into the world today we equate coming to church with worship or with praise that's not what it was about you were go you would go to the house of God to hear God's word being read first of all we get the description of this given in Ezra the scribe who when he came back they found the book of the law the people left their homes left their work joined in a public place so everybody could see separated themselves unto God and they listened to the reading of the word all day and they wept that was the worship was when it moved their hearts and caused the emotional response of weeping and repenting and they gave God praise today we we think that we're doing worship and praise and that that's what we're supposed to do you're just meaning to hear good music and a little bit of teaching but more of the fellowship that's what heathens do heathens move themselves emotionally and spiritually in the spirit of Baal or Bacchus now a matter of fact Baal Moradek means God of the dance means when his members are moved by his spirit they are they take on a form of dance they gyrate and sway their bodies and move their hips so the word ecclesia here literally means those who have left their homes their work set this time aside to meet with God and to hear his message from the messenger which is the pastor he's the pastor who is the teacher for the completion of the saints he is there to equip you so you can do the work of God meeting publicly makes it a witness to all those around so he says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus the letter to the Ephesians teaches us first of all about how the church of Christ would be involved in an act of spiritual warfare if you read through the book of Ephesians you see it as a church that was actually knee-deep in spiritual warfare it was a church that had to contend or fight for the faith but they had also become a church that had fallen under the influence of the enemy one of the things the enemy will do is the enemy of God will will do whatever it takes to disrupt or keep a person from being able to serve God verse 1 under the angel of the church of Ephesus write the word right here means put this into a writing put it into writing for reference so that they cannot forget it so that it's something that will be there for all time and eternity because they do not want this to continue again or to or to recrop but it needs to be stopped what's going on in the Ephesian church it needs to be corrected and there needs to be a, a testimony or something put in writing so they can always be remembered and we can thank them because today we have the book of Ephesian uh, Ephes, uh, of Ephesians and we have this letter in Revelations he says these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand it literally means this is the command it is dictated by you to you by the one who holds the seven seven stars in his right hand now literally what it means is the things that follow he has called himself by name it means God has spoken and it will happen literally he who holds the seven stars has spoken and what you are about to read is going to happen 
Holdeth means he has the power over it and is the master. When it says he holds the seven stars, it means he is the master over the seven stars. They are his to do with as he pleases. And he has full authority and control over them. My friend, the word seven means complete. And stars is interesting because the word seven means complete. And it means God gives the pastor everything he needs. And God is in control of the pastor. The pastor needs nothing except God. God holds the pastor in his right hand. And he will use him as he sees fit for the congregation or church. The pastor is a gift to that church. The word stars is the word aster, and it means a star. But here's what's important. It comes from the root stonumai, and it means to make furnish like a bed or a resting place. A strong, immovable, rigid, hard place or person. One that is uncompromising. The pastor is to be somebody that seems rigid and hard, but unmovable and uncompromising. But as a result, they're like a mountain, a place where you can come to rest, where you can lay your bed down, because they are going to be protecting over you, watching over you like a shepherd, and teaching you the truth. And they will not sway from the truth. They will not be bought. They will not be compromised. That's what the word star means. Unfortunately, today, many people call themselves pastors who are not stars. They're not astares. They do not have the stonume. In other words, they compromise quite a bit. I've met with several here in Ocala. I've quit meeting with them. I've given up on visiting churches because it seems like they're all into politics. They will care more about not offending people, but they don't care that they offend God. A true pastor will not compromise. A true pastor will keep themselves devoted entirely unto God. When it says that he holds them in his right hand, it literally means they sit in the center of his right hand. The right hand is the position of honor and authority. God will honor that pastor as he has his authority over them. And he goes on and he says, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The word who here, it means the same significant one, the only one. Walketh. And this word walk means he regulates. He regulates the golden candlesticks. And this word regulate, it carries with it the connotations that he makes progress with the golden candlesticks. And he will give them their due opportunities in order that they conduct themselves according to his will, as their life passes by. That's what that word walk means. When it says Christ is the one that walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, it means he is the one, the significant one, the only one of importance that walks in the midst. And walks means he is the one of importance that regulates them so that he can make progress with them. He will give them due opportunities in order to conduct themselves according to his will as their life passes. Just like a candlestick burns down, he gives it good opportunity to be used. And then he'll replace them when their candle burns out. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks means he's not only in the middle of them, but he's the center of them. He's the core of their being. They cannot exist without him. In the midst of any candlestick, you'll find a wick. It is surrounded by either fat or tallow or some other substance. Wax in today's world. He is the fiber in the midst, that which burns. He is the light. Once again, it's seven. It means they're complete. They lack nothing. He provides everything they need. They are golden. And this word golden here means precious. But it also means they are gold-stamped images. They bear his image. It is stamped upon them. Each church that is Christ, that has him in the center, will have the image of Christ pressed into it. And it is a forcible press that is done under heat. And it molds itself and forms that gold over those candlestick holders into his image. Candlesticks, of course, is the word lupnia. And it means lampstands, place, the place from which the light will shine forth. 
It is the stand that holds them. They are the ones expendable. They are burning up. But the stand will abide forever. He walks in the midst of them. You know what's interesting is each one of these words carries with it a strong connotation. For instance, he writes these letters to the churches of Asia. Asia means orient, and it means to orient yourself with because it's something you're not familiar with. And you know, for the new churches being established, the book of Revelations was written to these seven churches. Everything was new to them. And God is saying you need to orient yourself to what I'm about to say. Ephesus means permitted. You're permitted to walk away. He will permit you. You're not under the law. You do not have to stay with him. And just like a spouse that is not a believer or committed to the other one, they are permitted to leave if they want. The third one is smir, smyrna, and it means myrrh or ointment, a bitter gum, something bitter when you put it in your mouth, but which is costly, and it's a perfume that will aromate everything around it. It is a, a, made from a tree or a shrub in Arabia and Ethiopia, and the only way it can be obtained is by making incisions in the bark. It was also used as an antiseptic for cleaning wounds, and it was used for embalming the dead. The Church of Smyrna speaks about that, which is an offering unto God. Pergamos means a higher, elevated tower, a fortified structure rising to considerable height, in order to repel attacks, but it also enables watchmen to see in every direction. Thyatira, of course, means the odor of affliction. Pergamos, Sardis, different ones. Sardia means the red ones. Philadelphia means those of the brotherly love. Laodicea means the justice of the people, and it would be shown to their eyes. They would see the justice. But this letter is written to the church of Ephesus, and it speaks about how it, it is your responsibility to maintain your devotion to Christ. That he will allow you to walk away, and you will suffer for it. So, under the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. In other words, put this in a form of message. Give it to the messenger so he can teach it and preach it to the called out assembly of the permitted. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hand. And it means literally this one thing, speak, call and affirm to them from the chief master who has laid hold on them with his power. And he is the most powerful and he does this in order to rule and be master over the seven stars which are in his right hand, the pastors because they dwell within the confines of his right hand. They exist and subsist because of the position that he has given them in his place of authority and honor, his right hand. It is the same one who walks in the midst of the seven golden stand candlesticks. The same one whose life is in the church. He is the wick in the center of that tallow. All the fire, the light, comes from Jesus Christ that is in a church. Walking means he dwells in the midst of them so that he can regulate them, that he can make progress with them, and that their life, and though it will extinguish, will be lived out in his service. He has raised them up before the world and placed them openly as a stand for the purpose to give light, his light, to the rest of the world. Verse 2, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and they are not, and you have found them liars. When he starts out, he says, I know. It means literally, I can see, literally, I see all of your works, and my attention is upon you. How often do we as believers fail to recognize that God intentionally, intently watches every aspect of our lives? His eyes are on us. His attention is upon us. And he says, I know your works, and it means your works as a whole group, as a congregation, but also in that congregation, every single believer, he knows their individual part, what they do on their own. He knows the works of the group as a whole and the groups as a single. The works means the business and employment of. Employment and a business. A business means the corporate whole, what they're doing as a business, and in, in other words, to be prosperous and to reach out. And the employment means all those in that business, how they will work together to achieve that goal. He says, I know both the singular works and the group works. 
He says, I know how much effort each of you put in. And he also says, in this it means I know those who are simply going through the motions. I know it means I see with the eyes and I'm watching all of it, all of thy works and your labor, the deeds which you're in the business of doing, that which you have made so intense, though it is mixed with trouble, toil, or, or sometimes it takes you to the point where you want to beat your breast and lament with grief and sorrow. He says, I see all of it, and I know what you're going through. He says, but I also see your patience, your steadfast constancy and endurance. And that means the characteristics of the person who will not be swerved from their deliberate purpose. He says, I know whether you are deliberately holding that your faith and your loyalty and piety, even in the midst of the greatest of trials and sufferings, I see all this. <clears throat> he says, I also know how you cannot bear those which are evil. And it means those which are self-willed. It means you are unable in your own ability. You simply cannot bear them, those which are evil, because they are troublesome, they are injurious, pernicious, they're destructive, baneful. And he says, and the church should stand against this evil and fight for righteousness. Today, churches not only tolerate evil, they welcome it in many places. But that's not the way the church of Christ is to be. We are to preach against sin, we are to preach about separation unto holiness from unrighteousness. That's what the church is for. He says, I know how you cannot stand and will not tolerate those that claim they're apostles. That means those who allege or pretend or affirm that they have been sent as a messenger from God, like God is speaking to me, I know that this is his will, or this is what God wants us to do. I cannot tell you how many times people tell me my heart, the Lord has spoken to me, and this is what I should do. But you know what? The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. No one can know it except God. And guess what? If God is speaking to you, it will never contradict his scriptures. He always reveals his will through his scriptures. It will never go against his word. He says, I also know how you've borne and have patience for my name's sake. You have labored and have not fainted. You see, the Ephesian church was in the midst of spiritual warfare. They were being bombarded. And this literally means, indeed, you have picked up and put upon yourself the burden, taking a hold of the work patiently. For me, through Christ's namesake, that is the channel by which you've been able to perform this. And even though you have grown weary, Ephesian church, nearing exhaustion, you have not given in to your weariness, nor given up through exhaustion. But you do have a problem. He says, nevertheless, verse 4, I have something against you. What is it? You have left your first love. It's like the bride that leaves her husband. Jesus is our bridegroom. She's forgotten that her first and foremost commitment is to be devoted to him. And instead, she's let her business and her work take her out of the home and take her heart. When it says you've left your first love, it literally means your mind and your heart are consumed with the other things, not with the one you love. So he says, notwithstanding these things, I have an objection. An objection means you want you to, it's almost like putting your fist on the table and saying, stop, stop doing what you're doing. He says, with this exception, there is a restriction upon all this. I lay it in my hand against you, is literally what this means. I have somewhat against thee. It means I hold it in my hand and I'm showing you. And it would be like the husband confronting the wife saying, listen, this is wrong. I am objecting to your behavior and I am coming against you with this evidence right here. You have literally sent away that which was first, principal and foremost in rank in your life. To both God, Christ and other men. What is he saying? You no longer do these works as a church because you love God. You no longer are serving men because you're driven by a burning passion for Christ. You're reaching out to others, and your standing against evil has become a service, rather than a way of showing love for God and His Word. Today, churches do this all the time. They are busy with this program and that program and this, because it seems like the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to love the Lord and wait patiently for Him, 
Because when God is the center of the candle, he is the one that will open the doorway and give you the purpose and the ability to reach the goal. It will have a love that is generated and coming from both God the Father and through the indwelling Holy Spirit. He says, you've sent this away, and you've chosen rather to do the work for the sake of doing the work. And I have permitted you to do it in your own fleshly ways. That's what verse 4 is saying. So he says in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He says it again, except you repent. Literal language, remember, means you need to stop that objection. Stop right now. You need to take the time and draw up to your memory and hold them in your mind. Don't let it get away because the enemy will try to take away those thoughts and those memories. And he says you need to pull them from your memory into your conscience and fight for the truth. Therefore means accordingly and consequently these things being, they are there. In other words, don't be in denial. Don't argue with God. You have left your first love, and it's not up for date, debate. That's what he's saying. That word therefore means that. It means it is according, and it is consequently. I am going to pull your candle because it's not a debate. I'm telling you what has happened is what the Lord's saying. So he says, from whence? He says, this is the source of your falling, and you have fallen. It's a reiteration. Thou art fallen. What is the source? You have lost your love for God. You have lost the position you had with God, and you have now fallen powerless. And you are making no effect for the kingdom of God. How many churches today are so busy? They make such big building plans. They bring in so many people. But he says you're making no effect. You can have a church filled with people, but if they're not born again, it is a church filled with people that are taking that fellowship to hell. They're all rowing a boat that is leading them down the maw of the, the river Styx, and they will abide with Lucifer in the final day. So he says, repent. He says, you better change your mind for the better. Stop what you're doing and let go of it and return to where you were, because where you're at now is an abhorrence to the Lord God. That's what the word repent here means. And not only that, he says, and do. That means you need to become the authors of the cause. You have to initiate the change. You left it willingly and chose to go your own way, so you must willingly turn back to what I have given you. Come back to where I am, the first. That means that which is first in time, place, and of the highest influence, honor, and rank. It is the chief principal work, that which you did at the first. That should be your business and employment. My friend, the church is for preaching the gospel. The church is for teaching people the truth of God's word. Not making them feel friendly, not giving them a cappuccino when they come in, not pumping their kids full of donuts, making them feel happy to be a part of a group. The word of the church is to be the word of Christ. We're to preach against sin and preach for righteousness. Preach about the love of Jesus and how he's lifted you from the waters of hell. We're to be lifting the truth up. He says, or else, otherwise, if you don't do this, I will come. And it literally means I will arise, I will stand up from my throne and walk over to your candlestick, and I will permanently remove it. Now what's interesting is when he talks about permanently removing it, here's how he's going to do it. In the Greek it means by setting in motion excitement. Excitement that will cause riot and disturbance. You will be literally thrown into a commotion. And you know when you grab a candlestick and you do this, you move it left and right and you pull it. So he's not saying he's going to take away what you're doing. He literally says you'll become a ruckus, a place of noisy confusion and activity. You will emphasize being busy and active instead of resting in the power of the Lord. A candlestick that rests in the holder does nothing but let the light, the flame burn in it and it melts away as the light of Christ burns through it. He's saying you'll become very busy and there'll be confusion in the church because so much will be going on. That describes about 98% of the churches today, doesn't it? They're always so busy, they don't know how to come and just rest at the feet of the Lord, hear his word being spoken. Martha, Martha, you are cumbered about much thing. Who cares about the pots or the pans or the jelly donuts or the coffee? 
Why don't you come and sit down at my feet? Mary has chosen the right and proper place, and I will not take that from her. He says that he will literally take you from the position of providing light, and you'll be given over to the Lord of darkness that will blind your mind and will give you a false light to the world. He will appear just like Christ, but he'll actually be the Antichrist, the pseudo-Christ that you're serving. Only your immediate repentance will stop this from happening, because otherwise it is imminent. Verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaity, which I also hate. The word but means that nevertheless you have one good thing going for you that you have not let go of, and that's that you detest and pursue with hatred the business and employment of the Nicolaity. The Nicolaity were those who were meant, it means the destruction of the people. They are the ones who mix the teachings of truth with error. Like Balaam who put a stumbling block in front of Israel. You try to mix and mingle that which is worldly with that which is holy and of God. You cannot do this. It happens all kinds of times today. I was in a church where the men were all wearing hats in church. Worship hats, cowboy hats, jungle hats. The leader of the, the group was doing it. They were all wearing them. I said to the pastor, you know, the Bible's pretty plain. A man's not supposed to have his head covered, and it's a dishonoring to God. He says, well, we want people to feel accepted here. That's more important. I said, so it's not important to honor God? You'd rather dishonor God? No, 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 I always obey God. We always... I said, but you're very plain. The Bible says a man shall not even pray with his head covered. I said, and years ago, people would take their head off before they prayed, even if, if they were outside of church. I said, but all these men in your church, his heads are covered because we don't want to offend them. And once again, I said, but you'd rather offend God. No, no. See, he's in denial. He's a liar to himself. And because of that, he's letting these people ride that boat to hell. The Nicolaitans are that. They mix the world with the church. They say it's okay to dress like that. It's okay to sing music that doesn't have the name Jesus in it. But it's very spiritual. God hates that, detests it. Verse 7, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. That means to the individuals in there that are born again. Because there's a lot of people in this church at Ephesus that are not born again. But if you have the blood of Jesus has touched your ear, you can hear the words of the shepherd. That one, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. In literal, plain language, it means those that possess the ability to hear Listen to what is being said and heed the word. He says, whether you are an individual in the corporate group, he says you will conquer the enemy within the midst and you will stop all the busyness and you will return to where you rest at the feet of Jesus and listen to his word. That is how you worship him when you stop and rest at his feet and you adore him as you hear his word and you say, as the Lord has said, we will do. You see, he is a good bridegroom. We are his bride. And as a result, those who are truly born again, he will give to eat of the tree of life. It has 12 manner of fruit. The word tree, tree is the word zulon. And it means a tree that has been cut down to be used, usually as a cross that one would be shackled to. But the tree is still alive. So... If you have overcome, God will give you your cross to bear. That's your zulon. That means the tree of life. And it means by picking up that cross and following him, you will have absolute fullness of life. That's what this means. Life that is genuine, real, active, vigorous. One that is fully devoted to God, but blessed in the portion of this world and will be in the next, which will be the paradise of God. You must pick up your cross to follow Jesus. It's the Via Dolorosa, or the way of selflessness. It's not in busyness. It's not in programs. It's in trusting God and the power of God to burn as a light and resting at his feet and letting the word be preached. That is the only way that you can follow him to the resting place of paradise is by picking up your cross and following him. You cannot follow Jesus without the cross. There is a new heaven coming. Christ will be seated in the midst. He is going to be, he's got to be your first love, or you'll never be an overcomer.
An overcomer means you have conquered the temptations and trials of the greater church. And you've picked up your cross despite what they're doing. And you're going to rest at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. So if you've lost your first love, <clears throat> if you've become busy, you need to repent. You need to stop racing through the scriptures. And you need to sit down and just pray to God calmly, telling him your cares, your heart's desires, and reading his word. Read his word with patience. Pray it back to him. And let God speak to you, and he will. This has been Dr. Knotts. I'm going to continue this study for my friend Mary Davis. I pray the Lord blesses you as you endeavor to serve him. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.